Hello again, I'm Jeremy Bonger, and I've been working with a number of colleagues and students here at Caesar Faber Wildlife Research Institute, as well as partners with the USDA Agriculture Research Service on a number of projects involving cattle fever ticks. A little background information on cattle fever ticks. Most notably, they can carry and spread bovine babesiosis or cattle fever. Outbreaks of the disease were common through the early 20th century until the ticks were eradicated from the US around 1943. APHIS continues to maintain and closely monitor a permanent quarantine zone here shown in purple along the Mexican border. And you can see these blotches of red represent recent outbreaks of cattle fever ticks outside of the permanent quarantine zone. And they're primarily concentrated in Cameron and Willacy County down here in the south, as well as in Webb and uh, uh, Zapata County over here near Falcon Reservoir. In addition to cattle, we know that both Nilgai and white-tailed deer can carry and spread cattle fever ticks. And from inspections of captured or harvested animals, it seems that Nilgai are at least partially responsible for the outbreaks we see in Cameron and Willacy. And white-tailed deer are helping spread ticks over in the Sisapata County area. So white-tailed deer can be treated for cattle fever ticks using feeders filled with corn that is treated with ivermectin. However, this can only be done during the non-hunting season. And as we see out near Zapata, this is not entirely effective in all areas. Additionally, there are no known methods for treating wild male guys who do not typically use feeders like deer do. So our recent efforts have included various studies. We have conducted a couple of trials to see if wild male guy would learn to eat pelleted feed from a feeder if introduced uh, to other male guy that ate from feeders regularly. In summary, they didn't, and this doesn't appear to be a useful method, particularly at a large operational scale. So another study we're involved with was to evaluate the potential of motion-activated sprayers that emit microscopic nematodes that are known to kill ticks. This was for potential treatment of nilgai that commonly use known fence crossings. This study involved maintaining these sprayers at fence crossings, coupled with game cameras to monitor the use of these crossings. Additionally, we captured Nilgai multiple times to get regular tick counts and monitored movements of Nilgai with GPS collars. One of our graduate students, Catherine Sleva, will be talking next about some of the results from this study. And one of our more recent studies involves uh, the white-tailed deer around Falcon Reservoir near Zapata. This area receives very little hunting pressure and as a result has a high deer population. And one thought is that this high density is why we continue to find so many deer infested with cattle fever ticks. So we started a study just over a year ago that involved tracking movements of 100 deer with GPS collars and removing 300 does from the population. After Catherine finishes her presentation, you'll have the opportunity to hear from another graduate student, Ashley Hodge, speak about some of her preliminary results from this study. I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing from both students and at the end, all three of us will be available to answer any questions that you may have on the study. Hi, everyone. My name is Katherine Sleva, and I'm a master's student with the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. And today I'm going to be sharing our research on movement patterns and behavior of Nilgai antelope. Jeremy just gave us some great background information on Nilgai and cattle fever ticks. So I'm going to jump straight into our research objectives. The goals of this study were to learn more about Nilgai space use in South Texas. The specific objectives of the research were to estimate home range sizes of Nilgai, calculate average movement metrics, and assess Nilgai movement behaviors. This study took place on three private ranches in Cameron County, and we chose this area because it had recent cattle fever tick outbreaks that were linked to Nilgai. We captured Nilgai using the helicopter net gun technique and fitted 30 Nilgai with satellite GPS collars. Collars were deployed for a full year and we received locations every hour for 19 female and 11 male Nilgai. We separated Nilgai into two age classes, young and adult, based on tooth replacement of the incisors. Due to the heterogeneity between study sites, locational differences could have influenced Nilgai movement. The Western sites had more anthropogenic features like game fence and high volume roads, whereas Buena Vista is bordered by the Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge and the Gulf of Mexico. We define seasons based on biological timings of the Nilgai. For our first objective, we estimated home range sizes at the 95% density level and core range sizes at the 50% density level. We did this for each month, season, and for the overall locations. We tested the influence of sex, time period, and location on home range sizes at each temporal scale. 
Due to the variability in Nilgai home range sizes, our results are reported as median estimates. For our second objective, we used speed to summarize how far a Nilgai traveled each hour. We calculated maximum distance as the extent an individual traveled within a time frame, as seen in the upper graph. We calculated total distance as the cumulative distance an individual traveled between subsequent locations within a time frame, as seen in the lower graph. We calculated these metrics daily and monthly. For our third objective, we examined Nilgai movement behaviors using net square displacement. Net square displacement is a metric commonly used to identify migration periods in animals. It does this by measuring the distance an animal traveled in relation to its starting location. After comparing all locations to that starting location, this metric classifies movement patterns of the individual. We then verified the movement classifications assigned to each Nilgai by visual inspection. Nilgai movement behaviors were separated into four classifications. Resident Nilgai had overlapping seasonal ranges with periods of exploratory movements or capture-related excursions. Nilgai that appeared to have separate seasonal ranges spent most of the summer and winter in different areas. Nomadic behavior was defined as unpredictable or irregular movements, regardless of season, and individuals that dispersed left their area of residence and transferred to a new area where they established a new residency. From April 2019 to March 2020, we collected around 216,000 Nilgai locations. We collected a full year of data for 16 Nilgai, 13 females, and 3 males. Yearly home range and core range estimates were summarized and overall had high variability for both sexes. On the map, home range sizes can be seen as the lighter colored polygons and the core ranges are the darker inner polygons. Home range sizes differed between sexes each month with males having larger home range sizes than females. The bars on the graph are labeled with the median estimate for each sex. At the seasonal level, there was a sex and season interaction among home range sizes. In the summer, both sexes had rel relatively comparable home range sizes, and during the fall and winter, males had a larger home range size than females. At the seasonal level, there was a sex and season interaction where the core range for females did not significantly fluctuate between months, and males had larger core ranges in the fall and winter. Nilgai were most active during the crepuscular period, peaking during dawn and dusk. Nilgai had higher rates of activity at night than during the day, and the median distance traveled for females was 63 yards per hour and 75 yards per hour for males. The median maximum daily distance traveled for females was six tenths of a mile and for males, seven tenths of a mile. For females, the farthest distance traveled in one day was 6.3 miles and for males was 5.8 miles. The median total daily distance for females was 1.7 miles and for males, two miles. The greatest total daily distance traveled by a female was 7.9 miles and for a male, 10 miles. We plotted total distance on the x-axis and maximum distance on the y-axis to get a sense of Nilgai space use per month. Males showed greater space use per month than females, especially during the winter breeding season. The graphs on the next few slides will have the same setup with the top graph depicting UTM locations for an individual Nilgai color-coded by season and the bottom graph will display the results of the net square displacement metric. The red line is 1.5 miles from the starting location and is there as a reference to gauge how far an individual traveled. There were 17 Nilgai that exhibited resonant behavior and 15 of those individuals were adults. We saw seven Nilgai that had separate summer and winter ranges. Since five of those were young animals, these Nilgai could have dispersed or migrated. However, we only monitored these individuals for one year. There were four Nilgai that exhibited nomadic behavior. All four of these animals were adult males. None of these individuals were monitored for the full year, which could have influenced our assessment. There were two Nilgai that dispersed, both young females. Each of these Nilgai had their own unique dispersal journey. The first female traveled a maximum distance of approximately 24 miles in one year. This individual left the study area almost immediately after capture, and in less than two months, this Nilgai traveled around 112 miles until settling in a new area of residence. In the process, this individual crossed county lines, which is a major concern for disease management. The net square displacement graph for this Nilgai clearly shows the transfer period indicated by the vertical display of points. And as the Nilgai settled in a new area, the points begin to flatten out. The second female traveled a similar distance of around 25 miles in one year. However, this individual remained on Buena Vista for the entire summer before leaving. 
This new guy took up temporary residency in two new areas until settling down in a final location. This journey was about 40 miles. The journey is clearly depicted on the graph where you can see each transfer period where the Nilgai was moving to a new area and each time it temporarily stopped along the way. Previous studies reported no difference in home range size between sexes across seasons. However, our study indicated that males had larger home range sizes in the fall and winter. Since pig populations fluctuate throughout the year, seasonal changes in home range size are important for managers. Female dispersal is more frequently seen in bird species and is rather uncommon for mammals. Reasons for female dispersal could be a result of female social structure or to avoid inbreeding since Nilgai are an introduced species. Previous studies also reported younger females making long distance movements. Overall, it appeared that younger Nilgai exhibited movement behavior resulting in greater space use, whereas adult Nilgai tended to have more re resident and nomadic behavior. Adult Nilgai, especially males, tend to be more territorial and maintain communal latrine piles. Understanding host movement strategies is an important aspect in disease management. Our study provides key information that the cattle favor tick eradication program can use to adapt new technologies to treat tick infestations in Nilgai. By keeping the U.S. free of cattle fever ticks, the U.S. livestock industry saves $3 billion annually. Nilgai home range sizes are often greater than the average ranch size in South Texas, which can complicate eradication efforts. Overall, Nilgai that make long distance movements, disperse, use seasonal ranges, and exhibit nomadic behavior increase the risk of new cattle fever tick outbreaks in South Texas. This project would not have been possible without the hard work of numerous technicians and volunteers, the cooperation of the landowners, and the generous financial support. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ashley Hodge, and I'm a current master's student at Texas A&M University, Kingsville, and I'm going to be talking to you today about monitoring white-tailed deer movements relative to cattle fever tick management efforts along the U.S.-Mexico border. So our objectives for the study were to reduce deer density in our study population, evaluate space use and movement pre and post removal, <clears throat> excuse me, and determine efficacy of density reduction as a viable tool for cattle fever tick management. So our study area was located on international boundary and water condition land near Falcon Lake Reservoir in Zapata, Texas. It's federal land with a high density deer population that's also very difficult to access. So it's surrounded by private branches and has very limited public access. Uh, roughly the size of this land is 24,700 acres. I can't give you an exact uh, acreage because the size of land is actually dependent on our water level, which fluctuates. And so what we did is we captured 100 white-tailed deer using net gun and a helicopter in February of 2020. We slung these deer back to a central processing location and fitted them with GPS collars. We redeploy these collars whenever feasible. So whenever our deer, one of our deer unfortunately died, uh, we would try and collect the collar again. And whenever we had another capture, uh, we would definitely try and get that collar back out there. Um, all of our collars were, select, uh, were set to collect locations every hour for 52 weeks, and all of our deer were scratched for ticks, um, and any tick found was collected, counted, and identified to species. We also collected other useful information such as age, weight, and body condition score. So the next part of our study was this large scale removal that occurred in March of 2020. We only removed does because we wanted to reduce that population size to remove the alternative hosts in the area. All does caught regardless of age were euthanized. Uh, we either used a bolt gun and a net gun combination or aerial shooting. Um, and then again, the same method for tick collection was used and we collected, counted and identified everything to species. And so looking at our data analysis, we're quantifying our border crossings um, in ArcMap by delineating that Mexican shoreline at different water heights. So it's really important to, to do this because um, the way that the water is might be affecting where and when these deer are choosing to cross. Um, and then we're creating these time-based tracks to determine where and when they are crossing. Um, we're also calculating home ridges using um, dynamic Brownian bridge movement models in R, and we're splitting those up by sex and month. And so what have our, our results been so far? In 2020, we collared 102 females and 23 males. We did collar a higher number of females because we have a uh, sex ratio skew and there are certain hunting pressures if, um, you know, if deer are hunted, then males typically are selected over females. Uh, we also successfully removed 298 does throughout our study area. And all those carcasses were actually donated to the residents of Zapata County. 
Uh, so going down to our home ranges, uh, please note that the scale on the uh, y axis is different for the male and female. On our x axis is our month. Uh, and the number corresponds to the month. So three is March, four is April, uh, and so on. And so uh, we saw our female home ranges on average stay relatively small. We're seeing less than 300 acres uh, with some feet, but we did see some females with much larger home ranges, um, very comparable to our dispersing young males. Um, and then we saw males oftentimes averaging these much larger home ranges. Um, there's also several dispersal events happening. So we did call her a couple of young males um, and they made these very lar large treks. Um, and we saw some excursion events too that were pretty large. Um, and we did see in September a few uh, males with some pretty small home ranges. So there's a lot to explore there uh, to see kind of what's going on. And now talking about our border crossings. So um, this is between February and April. We saw the highest water level. Uh, we saw 18 crossing events from 18 unique deer. Moving on from May to July, we still saw some pretty high numbers up there with 76 crossing events from 19 unique deer, but this was um, our lowest water level for the year of 2020. From between August and October, we saw a mixed water level, so some high water levels, some low water levels, and we had 14 uh, crossing events from seven unique deer, although we did not see any crossing events in August. Between November and January, we had a mid to low water level. Our, we saw our increase, um, an increase in our crossings again, so we had 24 crossing events uh, from, uh, excuse me, from nine unique deer. Uh, moving on to our tick abundance. So these are all from our captured uh, animals, our colored animals. Um, so we had a total of 100 locations. Um, so if we look at our legends here, a purple X means that there was no ticks on the animal when we captured it. Um, that small green circle is uh, tick abundance between 1 and 25, and it increases, uh, the number of ticks increase all the way up to that big red circle, uh, which means they had a lot of ticks, over 100 ticks on it uh, with our um, with one individual having uh, 298 ticks on it. So we saw 43% had zero ticks, 32% uh, had that one to 25 and 7% had over a hundred. And we're starting to see, kind of see these isolated locations. There's still interspersion of, of deer with no ticks on them, but we're kind of starting to see some, some isolated areas here. Uh, so looking at our removed doe tick abundance, we had 221 locations. Our legend stays the same, except for um, that big red circle uh, because we had an individual with 306 uh, ticks on them. So we're still seeing, the, seeing these isolated areas of, of these higher tick abundance. Um, although our, our deer with no ticks are, are definitely interspersed some with, uh, with deer that did have ticks. Um, so we saw 34.3% had zero ticks on them, 47.5% had between one and 25, and we had 5% with over 100 uh, ticks on them. So in summary, we saw smaller home ranges um, in a lot of our females, which really complicates management efforts. Um, so when we're placing out these ivermectin feeders, we're going to have to start placing more if we want these to be available to more of the population. Um, we saw our females uh, averaging around 242 acres for uh, their home ranges and males averaging around 291 acres, although we did have several females um, having home ranges uh, comparable to males for their monthly home ranges. Um, there's definitely some unusual uh, movements of some excursions across the border, um, and we definitely had some dispersal events from young males, which can contribute to these local outbreaks. Uh, so talking about the border crossings, we can really look at life history to maybe explain some of this stuff. So again, we didn't see any crossings in August, uh, which is around the time that deer start fawning or are about to fawn. Uh, so they're not really going to be moving away uh, too much from their home range when they have a young one to feed. I mean, it's on the increase in, um, in crossings happen again when we, uh, when we were moving into fall. So kind of that pre-rut rut area. Um, so our tick abundance, we saw these localized areas of higher infestations, which provides a lot of support for uh, the USDA observations. So those guys are on the ground looking at this stuff, and uh, we saw kind of these hot spots, and, and those were the areas we kind of were expecting to see them from their observations. Our landscape is also very heterogeneous. So we have this tropical looking vegetation on the border, which can be right next to this grass field bordered by mesquite with no understory. So there's a whole bunch of variation of vegetation down there that could be really providing some really great uh, microclimates uh, for these ticks to be able to thrive in. 
And so our future work is going to be comparing these finer pre and post removal movements and space use, um, analyzing landscape metrics and tying that back into these isolated pockets of high tick numbers and continuously monitoring tick abundance, deer density, and uh, potentially uh, conducting future removals. So thank you so much to our collaborators. Uh, this definitely would not be able to be uh, done without them, especially to our people in the USDA TPWD, uh, our Zapata County Judge and Commissioners, and all the fellow graduate students and research technicians, excuse me, technicians that really helped out. And with that, happy to take any questions. Thank you so much.